the end of an of the epidemic is not the same as the end of disease. So you can see very much that disease for the most part continues on. Um, and so this is why it's very important to think about who decides how we make that end declaration, because it's actually not that the disease will disappear or the disease will be eradicated because of course actually very few diseases have ever been eradicated. <laughs> Hello, I'm Katrine Volder. This is Thinking Out Loud, conversations with leading philosophers and sometimes other academics from around the world on topics that concern us all. In this episode, I'll be talking to Erica Charters, who is Professor of Global History of Medicine at the University of Oxford. Professor Charters leads a multidisciplinary project on how epidemics end, so she's the ideal person to answer some questions for us about the end of the COVID-19 pandemic. So before we talk about the end of the pandemic, I thought it'd be useful to refresh our memories a little bit about the beginning of the pandemic. We all learned quickly about this strange virus uh, coming from Wuhan. And then we all remember the, the first reported cases in our countries. And then suddenly the WHO declared, you know, there was a pandemic. It was like, I think it was the 11th of March, 2020. So presumably the WHO had some checklist with some criteria and checked whether, you know, all the criteria were met and they were met. Then they said, oh, we have a pandemic. So is that more or less correct? What is interesting is, and I, and I don't know full details on exactly the criteria that the WHO uses, but most often the WHO, rather than declaring, for example, when something is an epidemic, um, because that tends to be a very regional decision, their declarations are usually focused on what's called a public health emergency of international concern. And so there's a very specific criteria that has to do with when they feel there's a danger to it spreading beyond national borders, but also that it requires international attention, including international aid. So it's, a, it's an interesting point that it's not just a definition focused on um, say, biomedical information, it's also thinking about whether the international health organization, whether international organizations need to be involved and whether other countries should be aware um, and involved in the outbreak. How about the end of the pandemic? Um, is that sort of as straightforward or is it a bit more complicated? We tend to think that the outbreak and the declaration of an outbreak is, is somewhat straightforward, although we can also discuss how the origins of when we say an epidemic actually started, as we will know with COVID-19, also is quite murky, right? So it can go back further in time. For HIV AIDS, for example, there's been a long history of, of rethinking when that actually started. But the same thing we see is the end also is is a process, it's very complex, it's very messy. And I think what we found most strikingly when we're doing research is that the end of, an, of the epidemic is not the same as the end of disease. So you can see very much that disease for the most part continues on. Um, and so this is why it's very important to think about who decides how we make that end declaration, because it's actually not that the disease will disappear or the disease will be eradicated because of course actually very few diseases have ever been eradicated. It seems that what you're saying is wh whether we decide an epidemic ends because it seems like it's a decision will depend on what our goal is. A really important way to think about this is that the definition of an epidemic is about disease rates above expected or, or normal rates. Um, so there's not actually, of course, a metric of what that means, right? So although you might say within different regions, okay, this is the expected disease rate, and therefore when it rises above that, then we call it an outbreak or an epidemic, or if it's across many countries, a pandemic. And so the, the kind of clinical definition of the end of an epidemic is therefore when disease rates um, subside or reach what are called, um, very often it's defined as acceptable levels um, according to what is locally acceptable. And again, we can think about how different parts of the world live with different types of diseases and different rates of diseases. So that's why Again, I'm very interested in this category of epidemic because it's not actually something that we can take for granted. And as much as it is true that we need the biomedical information and say numbers of cases or numbers of deaths to make that decision, that alone isn't going to tell us, right? So we can think about how there's many parts of the world in which they live with malaria. If we had 
a malaria outbreak in England, it would probably be considered an epidemic because it would be a problem and it would be an unusual disease. So it's not even the rates, it's the type of disease. You can see how it's a regional definition and the same thing, the other way of thinking about this is the way that influenza works. So we always have rates of influenza. It's an epidemic because it rises above expected levels. And so therefore we have these kind of cyclical patterns to influenza. And so to me, this is the really um, useful reminder when we're thinking about epidemics is the opposite of, a, of an epidemic is not a lack of disease. We, we always live with disease. The question is in some ways the proportion and the ratio. And so therefore it becomes a real question of what do we as a society, what are we willing in some ways to live with, um, especially in terms of regulations and rates of disease. But that will, of course, differ very much from society to society. And even within society, um, there are clearly groups who, well, probably, first of all, never believed there was a pandemic. Then there are groups who think the pandemic has been over for several months. And then there are groups who think the pandemic is still not over. So does each individual then sort of decide for themselves whether a pandemic is over? It is true that um, when you look at endings, it's very messy. Uh, we definitely know that pandemics end in different places at different times. So HIV AIDS, I think has been a very classic example of how that pandemic ended as an epidemic for, for many parts of the world, pretty much in Western parts of the world, but of course it's continued on in various ways as an epidemic um, in other parts of the world, especially in Africa. So that's a a very good example of the way that a pandemic then kind of ended in these different ways in different regions. But I think you're right that even within one society, the ending is very messy. It's something that I found really fascinating in the project is this is not really about consensus and there's not one single answer. In fact, there's going to be a lot of competing definitions. Um, and partly because I think people measure different things when they're talking about what is the end of an epidemic. And people have different values. So you could think of uh, maybe the UK where people's liberty is valued quite highly. And then maybe if I think of some yeah, Asian countries, maybe where public health is valued uh, much more compared to liberty. Um, so these societies have different values, but different weight on these values. So they will reach different conclusions. Exactly. And I think... Again, this is why it's so fascinating because on the one hand, we think of disease obviously about the way that it affects us as individuals. Public health is about the community and how it affects other people. And so constantly, I think there's this tension between those two and, and I, as a historian, I can't say that there's one answer or one trend. If anything, you can simply see how important social context um, even cultural understandings of, say, health and disease can't be taken for granted. And so there's there's certainly no historical model that you could say this is the solution. I think what you're going to see instead is, an, is a number of different ways. In the same way, I think there's been a number, a number of different models of dealing with COVID. So I think in the same way, there's going to be a number of different ways of thinking about how the epidemic ends. I just wonder whether there is a, a risk there, though. So I sort of have the, I don't know, the maybe the worry that here we'll say like, oh, the disease is more or less under control. It's an acceptable level. Um, so the pandemic is over. And in the meantime, in Africa, there might be new variants developing uh, because vaccination rate is low because of our, um, you know, immoral decision not to <laughs> distribute vaccines fairly. I'm not blaming them. Um, so if we say oh, the, the pandemic is over, that might actually be quite a risky yeah. yes. declaration, so to speak. Yeah. And, and I think one way of thinking about this, so it's a bit like, as you were saying at the beginning about the declaration, um, when someone decides and who decides to say it is an epidemic or for the WHO, it's a public health emergency of international concern, that of course is actually a declaration of thinking about what we should do with our attention, right? And saying, this is a problem and also that it becomes the most urgent problem. And so, you know, we have limited resources as individuals and as states. And so I think it's a real question of when you say this is an epidemic or a pandemic, what you're saying is this is a problem and very often the most urgent problem. And then the question becomes, all right, when do 
either other problems become more pressing or when, as you're saying, when does it become someone else's problem and therefore not one, not one that we're, we're looking at. So I think this is, I think there's a, um, a real power to the declaration and therefore also real power to kind of when you are saying the crisis is now over. The, there's a historian, Dora Farga, who said how um, an epidemic is over when it becomes someone else's problem. Uh, and I think, again, you're right that, that you see how it's a, it becomes a regional concern. That's exactly this point about what type of problem it is and, and where it ends up being located. So, yeah, because you're a historian. So what, what can we learn from, these, um, from the pandemics in the past um, to deal with current pandemics, especially when it comes to the end of pandemics? How, how did we uh, determine that there was the end of the Spanish flu pandemic, for example? I think one one thing which might not be comforting for people to hear and might be in other ways is that very often people don't know when they're in the end of an epidemic. <laughs> it's very hard, of course, to predict when you're when you're in the midst of a disease outbreak, especially because as we've seen, disease it, it tends to come in cycles. And so you you're in a decline. And is that the final decline or is that just decline before the next wave. And so what is interesting is there's many cases, so that the end of the second plague pandemic um, in places such as England, it took them at least 100 years to be convinced that actually plague really wasn't returning back to England. And, and so you can see it's an interesting point of um, when you're a historian, you can look back and we might know so much more than people who are living through it at the time, which I think is somewhat unnerving for those of us living through an epidemic. But I think that the comforting part is, of course, societies really do um, come back together. One of the, I think, one theme which historians would want to stress is that an epidemic is not just about um, medicine it's not just a biological crisis because it's also a period when everything seems to become uncertain so politics becomes uncertain the way that we respond to other humans becomes uncertain all of our frameworks for understanding the world in many ways seem to collapse during a, an epidemic and so historians have traced how humans then tend to respond by practicing kind of communal behavior and rituals as a way to come back together and so the end process isn't just about the decline in disease it's also about how does society reconvene because of course what an epidemic does is it tends to tear people apart right we not only have the disease that's um, given us a different experience of illness but we also have public health measures that tend to be very divisive, right? They tend to divide communities, they polarize opinions. And so this end process also needs to be one in which there's a kind of social and moral restitution and, and a way of how do you rebuild communities and rebuild trust, which very often um, has been eroded. And I will say, look, the cholera epidemics in the 19th century, there were very violent uprisings. And so in that sense, we can take some comfort from history in knowing that even though things have been very difficult, um, there's there's been much more, <laughs> there's been epidemics that have been fundamentally troubling to societies and, and humans have come back together after them. <laughs> If you like this interview, don't forget to subscribe to the Practical Ethics channel on YouTube. 